Nonviolent communication offers us a different language than a language that implies whether people deserve to be punished or rewarded. Nonviolent communication focuses our attention on human needs, whether human needs are being fulfilled or not. When they're not, obviously what is called for is to find ways that we can behave that nurture these needs. This is a radically different way of thinking, so instead of judging right or wrong to determine whether people are punished or not, or rewarded or not, nonviolent communication focuses on what is happening to our needs. If our needs are not being fulfilled by what is happening, let us take action that fulfills our needs. If our needs are being fulfilled, let's celebrate. So this is a radical departure from the language of domination, a language of judging what people are. A nonviolent communication shows us three other important forms of communication that support expressing our needs and understanding the needs of other people. First, nonviolent communication suggests clarity about actions that are supporting needs being fulfilled or not. So nonviolent communication suggests that we make clear observations, that we can tell people when their actions are meeting our needs and when their actions are not meeting our needs. Another component of nonviolent communication are feelings. Feelings are manifestations of what is happening to our needs. When our needs are not being fulfilled, we feel unpleasant feelings. When our needs are being met, we feel pleasurable feelings. And a fourth component of nonviolent communication our requests. When we see that our needs are not being fulfilled, we need to request of ourselves or others what actions we would like taken to better meet our needs. So these four components make up nonviolent communication. The most basic, our needs. And then, observations of what is fulfilling our needs and what isn't. Feelings to identify the results of what's happening to our needs now. Whether they're being met or not, our feelings reveal that to us. And our request, what we would like done about our needs that are not being fulfilled. These four components are rather different than the language that I was taught. I went to schools for 21 years. And in those years of schooling, I was never asked, for example, what my needs were or what my feelings were. And very rarely was I ever asked what my requests were. The schools I attended were basically schools in which the teachers use the language of judgments. They told you whether what you did was right or wrong, good or bad. And so in such an environment, we don't learn a language of life. We learn a language that orients us to what authority wants us to believe and do. So nonviolent communication shows us both how to make these four components clear to people. And these four components basically answer two questions. What's alive in us? You see, when we say what is contributing to our well-being, how we feel and what our needs are that are behind our feelings, that answers the question of what's alive in us at a given moment. And a second question that nonviolent communication directs itself to is what would make life more wonderful? And that's where our requests come in. We say what we would like to make life more wonderful. 
So nonviolent communication involves sharing what's alive in us and what would make life more wonderful, and to receive the same information from other people, to connect with what's alive in them and what would make life more wonderful for them. And it has been my experience that when we connect at this level, what's alive in each other and what would make life more wonderful for each other, and we avoid the following, we can find ways of getting everyone's needs fulfilled compassionately. But we need to avoid the following. First, we need to avoid any language that sounds like criticism or blame or insults. Next, we need to avoid presenting our request to others in which they hear as a demand. I have found through my working with people over the years that any time people hear criticism or demands makes it very difficult for people to enjoy contributing to one another's well-being. So nonviolent communication suggests that we avoid at all times the following strategies for trying to influence people to do what we are requesting. We want people to know that we never want anything done that we request out of guilt or shame created by criticism they hear coming from us. I believe that any time we influence people by criticism, blame, insults, even if they do what we request, it will be very costly to us because then they're not giving compassionately from the heart. They're giving to avoid shame or guilt. And giving done out of that energy, I believe, is costly to both parties in any relationship. Nonviolent communication also suggests that we avoid at all times any use of punishment. Now that uh, shocks many people around the world that I work with. They have the idea that without punishment you have anarchy, you'll have violence, you'll have all kinds of horrible things happen. They believe that the only way you can have order is through a justice system in which people are punished if they don't do what the authorities think is right. In subsequent sessions I will show how we can resolve conflicts without any kind of punishment. But that's not easy for many people to feel comfortable with that I work with because they have been in schools, families, governments that are all set up on the basis of retributive justice. The idea that there are certain things you must do and if you don't do them, then you deserve to suffer for what you have done. And if you do these things which are defined as right by authorities, then you deserve to be rewarded. So when I suggest other alternatives to conflict resolution than punishment and reward, it's enormously shocking to people. One of the things that helps is I say to people that if you ask yourself two questions, you will see that punishment and reward never work. And what are these two important questions? Question number one. If somebody's doing something you don't like, what would you like them to do differently? Now, if you answer only that question, it can lead you to think that punishment sometimes works, because certainly we can all think of evidence, I would guess, of a time when maybe we were influenced to do something out of fear of punishment, or we were able to influence our children to do things that because they were afraid they'd be punished if... They didn't. So if you define works as simply getting people to do what you want, punishment sometimes works. But if you ask a second question of yourself, I believe you will see that punishment never works. And what is this second question? What do you want the other person's reasons to be for doing what you request of them? When people ask this second question, what do you want other people's reasons to be for doing what you want them to do? 
they soon see that any time we get people to do things out of fear that we're going to punish them if they don't, or out of shame or guilt, it's very obvious then that whatever we got that person to do is costly because we are then experienced as a source of violence. Somebody who is prepared to make them suffer if they don't do what we want. And it's pretty obvious to everybody that that is very costly because to whatever degree people see us as violent rather than compassionate makes it that much harder for them to enjoy compassionately relating to us. Now, people wonder why I put rewards into this same category of something that if you ask, what do you want people's reasons to be, that you won't use it. They say, well, aren't rewards nice? Doesn't it make people want to do things? And I say it may motivate people to do things, but that's not getting people motivated to do things out of compassion out of enjoyment that comes naturally from contributing to people's well-being. Rewards get people to do things out of a whole different energy, not out of a desire to enrich life, but out of a desire to gain something that they want to gain. I like very much Alfie Cohn's book, Punished by Rewards, for clarifying how rewards are equally violent as punishment. Now, nonviolent communication then suggests that we not only avoid criticism, rewards, punishment, it also suggests the danger of a language that denies choice. I often refer to this language that denies choice by using the German word Amtssprache. I started to use that phrase Amtssprache, having read about the Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann. At his trial for war crimes in Jerusalem, Eichmann was asked, was it difficult for you to send thousands of people to their death? Eichmann answered very honestly. He said, To tell you the truth, it was easy. Our language made it easy. That answer shocked his interviewer, and his interviewer said, What language? And Eichmann said, My fellow Nazi officers and I, we came up with a name for describing the language which we were taught in schools to use and, and especially to use in our position as officers in the military, and we called this language Amtssprache, between us. Well, in German, Amt means office and Sprache means language, so what they were referring to then was a language of bureaucracy. Eichmann was asked for some examples of Amtssprache. And Eichmann said, it's a language in which you deny responsibility for your actions. And if you don't feel responsible for your actions, you don't feel so bad when you do things like send people to their deaths. He was asked for some examples of this. And Eichmann said, well, if somebody asks you why you do it, you say, I had to. I had no choice. And if people question that and say, well, what do you mean you had no choice? Then you say, superior's orders, company policy, it's the law. A dangerous, dangerous language, a language that denies choice. Nonviolent communication is designed to help us remain conscious of choice every moment, to believe that every action we take, we choose to take don't necessarily like some actions that we take, but we don't do anything we don't choose to do. That bothers a lot of people when I say that in our trainings around the world. For example, a story that clarifies this occurred in a city in the United States where I was working with some parents and teachers and when I suggested that words like have to, should, ought, must, can't 
are dangerous, as I would define danger, because they turn out people who don't feel responsible for their actions. And one of the mothers who attended this session got very upset, and she said, but there are some things you have to do that you have no choice over. There are things I do every day that I hate to do, but there are some things you have to do, and it is our job as parents and teachers to see that our children do what they have to do. I said to her, could you give me an example of something you do that you believe now that you have no choice about? And she thought for a moment and said, oh, there's so many things. But okay, here's one. When I go home this evening, I have to cook. I hate to cook. I hate it with a passion. But I have done it every day for 20 years. Even when I've been sick, I do it. There just are some things you have to do. I told her I was very sad to hear anybody do anything even one time out of that kind of thinking, thinking in which you believe you have no choice. And I told her that I was hoping that if I made clear the value of nonviolent communication and she applied it, she would see many more options open to her in her life. I'm pleased to say she was a very rapid student and applied nonviolent communication very quickly in her life. She went home that very evening from the workshop and announced to her family that she no longer wanted to cook. I got some feedback from her family. The feedback happened three weeks later when at another introductory session I was doing in town who shows up but her older two sons? She had four sons. And they came up to talk to me before the session started. And I said, I'm really glad you came up to visit me before the session started. I'm very curious as to what's going on in your home. Your mother has been calling me up about every other day, telling me about the major changes she's been making in her life since the training. And I'm always very curious as to how other family members respond to this. When one family member comes home speaking a rather different language. I said, for example, that first night when she said that she no longer wanted to cook, I'd like to know what reaction you had to that. And the oldest son said to me, Marshall, I just said to myself, thank God. I said, uh, how did you come to that? He said, I said to myself, now maybe she won't complain at every meal. That very clearly communicated what concerns me about any language that denies choice. It leads us often to be slaves of authority when it is not to the well-being of people to be slaves of authority. So, nonviolent communication is a language that heightens our consciousness that we have choice. Every moment of our lives, we have choice. Nobody can make us do anything. My own children taught me that. From the time they were two years old on, they taught me I couldn't make them do anything. If I were to say, please put your toys back in the toy box now, it's time for dinner. They might say, no. And I would say, don't you hear what Daddy said? Please put your toys back in the toy box. No. So my children taught me I couldn't make them do anything. All I could do is make them wish they had. Then if I would do that, they taught me another lesson, that if I made them wish they had, they would make me wish I hadn't made them wish they had. In other words, violence creates violence. Punishment creates counter-violence.